step into the unknown and do something sometimes without knowing how the outcome will be. There is nothing exciting about a safe bet or the middle of the road. If you're not on the edge, you're taking up too much space. find uh, the strength to overcome the challenges ahead. There's an incredible human being left for you to discover once you reach the edge. If you want to make a difference in life, be a scientist. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I please have your attention? Our talk is about to begin. Thank you very much for attending our keynote session for today. And good evening to everyone here with us and everyone online too. Very much excited to welcome you today to our talk. Today we will find ourselves at the intersection of art and science and we will be guided through to the edge of human knowledge and beyond by Professor Paul Sutter. We will talk about such matters as dark energy, the origins of life, and climate change, and we will look at how all of us can push towards the limits and beyond of current human knowledge. Here to introduce our today's speaker and moderate the session is Professor David Keyes, the Professor of Applied Mathematics and Computational Science here at CAUS, the Director of the Extreme Computing Research Center. As you know by now, I think, the talk will be one hour long with 15 minutes Q&A. Please join me in welcoming on stage Professor David Keyes and Professor Paul Sutter. Thank you. Thank you, scholars. Paul Sutter is a theoretical cosmologist at the Institute of Advanced Computational Science at Stony Brook University and a researcher at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute in New York City. Moreover, and the main reason for his role in WEP, he is an award-winning science communicator, having authored two books, Your Place in the Universe and How to Die in Space, and hosting several TV shows, including how the Universe Works, Space Out, and The Edge of Knowledge. He also writes and hosts his own Ask a Spaceman podcast, which has been downloaded over seven million times. Paul is also a globally recognized pioneer in the intersection of art and science. His latest collaboration is a production with the Siren Modern Dance Company of New York that explores the nature of time which he recently performed as the United States Cultural Ambassador at the World Expo in Dubai. I have had the honor, and I should say the joy, of Paul's acquaintance since he was a graduate student at the University of Illinois where he earned his PhD in physics in 2011 on a US Department of Energy Computational Science graduate fellowship, which program both of us now serve as reviewers. Yesterday, on Paul's first full day at WEP, we explored together the edge of our mountain climbing abilities, together with many dozen Kaus students, wedging our bodies through crevices on the side of Moon Mountain to ascend to a beautiful 360-degree view of that 220-meter volcanic Jabal near Garan, and then doing our best to stay upright while skating on the scree 
all the way down. Today, Professor Sutter plans to take us much further than merely to the edge of the physical world with a talk titled, as you heard, The Edge of Knowledge, Challenges and Opportunities for the Next Generation of Scientists. Take it away, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the very warm introduction. And as for you, I have a question to get things started. By a show of hands, has anyone ever seen a night sky like this? Anyone? Good, good. If you haven't, KAUST has a wonderful astronomical association headed by Diego Rojas. I suggest you talk to him. When you see a sky like this, the sky that our ancestors knew, you can't help but feel like the entire universe is contained within the dome of the sky above you. That this is it. That when you look out at the stars, you're looking to the very edge of the universe. And as you study those stars, as you start to pay attention to them and watch them, you begin to have the feeling that the stars are somehow different than us. Think of your lives here on Earth. Think of how chaotic and unpredictable life here is on Earth. Think of all the twists and turns you took to get to where you are today. And think if you can predict where you'll be in a year or a decade. Life here on Earth is unpredictable and chaotic and messy, but the stars are different. The same sun rises in the east every morning. The same moon comes around every month. The same stars appear year after year after year. The heavens are orderly and regular and predictable and perfect. Except for the comets. Okay, there's the, the comets just appear randomly out of nowhere, random directions at random times, completely unpredictable. They look weird. For millennia, astronomers around the world, in many cultures and many traditions, noticed and recorded the comets and had no idea what they were. But most of them believed that the comets were an atmospheric phenomenon. There was something happening here on the Earth. Why? Because they were unpredictable. They were messy. They obviously belonged to us, not to the perfect heavens. This view stayed until 1577. 1577 was a very special year. A great comet visited the Earth. Astronomers in Europe, the Middle East, and China recorded this comet. But at that time, there was a certain special astronomer, perhaps one of the greatest astronomers ever to live, by the name of Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe was living in Copenhagen at the time, and when this comet appeared, he had a question for it. He asked this comet, how far away are you? How far away are you? What exactly is the edge of the universe? Now, to measure the distance to a comet, or any astronomical object is rather challenging because it's not like you can walk out paces or take a tape measure. You need to employ some other tricks. And Tycho Brahe employed a trick that had been known for millennia. And it's a trick called parallax. And to demonstrate this trick, I need everybody to place their finger right in front of their nose, just like this. It's okay, everyone can do it. There you go, good job. Now. I want you to close one eye and look past your finger up at me. Hi. All right. Now switch eyes. Huh? Now switch back. Camera one, camera two. Camera one, camera two. What's happening to your finger when you switch perspectives? It's changing. It's changing. Good, good, good. Now extend your finger. At, you know, give yourself a nice stretch here in your arm. Do the same thing. One eye, the other. One eye, the other. What's your finger doing? 
Still changing, still changing. All right, everyone now look at my finger up here. I'll hold it as still as I possibly can. Do the same thing. Camera one, camera two. Maybe those of you up front might see a little bit of a wiggle, but I bet those of you in the back can hardly see any wiggle at all. You are now, congratulations, you are now all astronomers. Who knew it was so easy? You can get PhDs in this stuff and everything. You're measuring a distance. Why? Because you know the distance between your two observation points. This forms the base of a triangle. And you can measure the angle of this difference, this parallax shift, contrasted against a distant background. So you have a base and you an angle, an angle, you do a little bit of trigonometry, you can calculate a distance. So when this great comet appeared in 1577, Tycho Brahe was in Copenhagen. He made very detailed measurements of the position of this comet relative to the distant stars. And he had a friend down in Prague doing the exact same thing. And then a few weeks later, they got together and compared notes. And they measured no parallax at all. No parallax at all. That told Tycho Brahe that the comet could not be in our atmosphere, otherwise they would have been able to measure a parallax, a shift in the position. And in fact, this comet, as far as they could tell, had to be beyond the orbit of the moon. This comet belonged in the heavens. The supposedly perfect, orderly, predictable heavens had these comets within it. He pushed the boundaries of the edge of the universe. This was 1577. This was part of an ongoing revolution in science and understanding of the natural world that challenged the accepted view that the earth was at the center of the universe. People began to discuss, began to argue that perhaps if the heavens are not as orderly as we thought, maybe the heavens aren't so different than we thought. Maybe the earth is not at the center of the universe. Maybe the earth is a part of the universe. Maybe the earth revolves around the sun and not the universe revolving around the earth. This idea had its proponents like Galileo, Kepler, Copernicus, and it also had its opponents, opponents like Tycho Brahe. The same person who proved that comets belong in space out there in the universe did not like the idea of the earth orbiting around the sun. Here was his argument. He said, okay, Let's assume your model is true so we can work it out and then I can prove you wrong. Standard academic trick. If you've ever had an advisor, you know exactly what he's doing here. He's going to say, okay, let's make this the sun and I'm the earth. And in one season, say springtime, I can accurately measure the positions to the stars. And I am the world's greatest astronomer, at least according to myself, Tycho Brahe. So I can do this. And then I'll wait six months. And I'll be on the other side of this, uh, what do you call it, a solar system? That's cute. Now I'm on the other side six months later. Look at this change in vantage point. Hundreds of millions of kilometers away. I should be able six months later to precisely measure the distances to the stars. And I should see a parallax shift. He performed this measurement on dozens of stars. He saw no parallax shift whatsoever. So Tycho Brahe said, look, you have two choices. Either the earth is at the center of the universe, in which case you'll never measure a parallax shift because we're never moving. Or if you want the earth to orbit around the sun, then the stars, the edge of the universe has to be, are you ready for this? 800 times further away than Saturn. That was a ridiculous number at the time, to think that the universe was that big. And you know what? No one had a response to Tycho Brahe. No one. His objection stood. Eventually, the idea of the Earth orbiting the sun came into fashion. 
not because of any great scientific evidence or weight of proof, but because it made calculating horoscopes easier. True story. The 1600s go by. No one can measure a parallax distance to a star. The 1700s go by. No one can measure a parallax distance to a star. Nations rise and fall. We invent steam engines, the telegraph. And still, no one can measure a parallax distance to a star. One of the challenges is that there are a lot of stars out there. And presumably, some are closer than others. But which ones? We, we would want to just measure the parallax to all these stars, but we don't have enough grad students for that. So, so we need a trick. We need to figure out which stars are closer to us, because that will be the easier measurement. But which ones are closer? Some stars are brighter than others, but are they bright because they're close, or are they bright because they're bright? We don't know. Nature gave us a clue. It turns out that stars move. They do. Stars slowly shift their position. It takes centuries, millennia to notice this effect, which is why it took until uh, modern astronomy and telescopes to be able to measure this, but they move. Here's one example. This is called Barnard Star. These images were taken 50 years apart. The stars move, and this gives us a clue. Some stars are moving faster than others. And if you assume that the stars are moving with some average speed through space, that the faster ones are going to be closer. To think about this, imagine you're standing next to a, a multi-lane highway. And the cars are moving down that highway with the same average speed. Some are faster, some are slower, but there's some average speed to all the cars. The cars in the lane closest to you will cross your field of view very quickly because they're right next to you. But the cars that are in the farthest lane from you, even though they're going the same speed, will take longer to cross your field of view. It's just a trick of geometry, of perspective. So maybe the fastest stars are closest to us. It's worth a shot. At the time, we had no other way to guess the distances to the stars. It wasn't until 1833 that we finally measured a distance to a star. And that star is one of the closest ones to the Earth. It's called 61 Cygni, the 61st brightest star in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. Who knew? It's, uh, it's somewhere in there. I think it's the blue one in the middle. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's unremarkable. But in 1833... An amateur astronomer by the name of Friedrich Bessel figured it out. You may have already encountered Bessel through his famous Bessel functions, or should I say infamous Bessel functions. But he didn't just pioneer in mathematics, he pioneered in astronomy. He built his own telescope, his own observatory, his own measuring equipment. And in 1833, over 200 years, after Tycho Brahe raised his objection to the size of the universe, Friedrich Bessel gave an answer. He measured the distance to 61 Cygni. And when he went to explain these results to the public, he found that the distance was so enormous that he needed to create a new word. He coined a word, light year. The distance light travels in one year. 61 Cygni is about 10 light years away from us. To give you some perspective, remember Tycho Brahe paled at the thought of the stars, of the edge of the universe being 800 times further away than Saturn. 61 Cygni, one of the closest stars to us, is 60,000 times further away than Saturn. With one measurement, with one observation, 
Friedrich Bessel exploded our understanding of the universe, pushed the edge of the universe orders of magnitude farther away than we ever thought possible. That was 1833. In the decades that followed, astronomers did what astronomers do best, which is copy each other. And they captured parallax after parallax after parallax of stars, pushing out the boundaries of the universe 10 light years away, 100 light years away, 1,000 light years, 10,000 light years away, a universe 10,000 light years across, enormous. And among those stars, astronomers also discovered other strange objects, like the nebulae. Nebulae are cloudy, wispy structures in space. The word nebula comes from the Greek word for cloudy, wispy thing. No two are alike, different colors, different shapes. And strangest of all, in the upper right-hand corner, this is from a sketch in the mid-1800s, by the way. In the upper right-hand corner represents a spiral nebula perhaps one of the strangest kinds of nebula that we had observed. There's a very famous spiral nebula known as the Andromeda Nebula. It's within the Andromeda Galaxy. You can see it with the naked eye. It looks like a fuzzy patch about the size of an outstretched fist. It's a spiral nebula. Here's a photograph of the Andromeda Nebula taken in 1901. You can see how interesting this is. There's a bright, dense core with so many stars in it, you can't even see the individual stars. There are these dark dust lanes, and the stars themselves form this disc-like spiral pattern. Absolutely fascinating and beautiful. How far away is it? Astronomers attempted to use the parallax method on this nebula, and they couldn't measure any parallax. It was too far away. How far away is this nebula? 10,000 light years? 50,000 light years? 100,000 light years? How far away is the edge of the universe? Parallax couldn't do it. We needed another trick. Nature gave us one. You see, there's a special kind of star known as a Cepheid variable. As their name suggests, they vary in brightness. They get brighter and dimmer over the course of a few days or a few weeks. Some of these variable stars dim and brighten very quickly, very rapidly, and some go very slowly. In the early 1900s, a wonderful astronomer by the name of Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered a remarkable property about Cepheid variables. She found that the longer it takes for a Cepheid variable to change in brightness, the overall brighter it is in real life, as if you're standing right next to it. And when Cepheid variables vary very quickly, like this, if you're standing right next to it, it'd be relatively dim. Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered that a method to determine the true brightness of these stars. They are what we call in astronomy a standard candle. Because when you look at a star, you don't know how bright it is in real life if you were up close to it. Because it can be bright because it's bright or it can be bright because it's close. You don't know which is which. But Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered that Cepheid variables, she found a way to measure their true brightness. So you can watch a Cepheid variable vary in brightness. You can compute a true brightness from that. You compare that to how dim it appears to us. And you do a little bit of trigonometry. You can calculate a distance. A new method for measuring distances to objects in space. Following on her work, the astronomer Edwin Hubble 
discovered two dozen Cepheid variables within the Andromeda Nebula. He watched them vary in brightness over time. He used that to calculate a true brightness. He compared that to the brightness that he saw and used that to calculate a distance. And he was the first one to discover that the Andromeda Nebula is not the Andromeda Nebula, it's the Andromeda Galaxy. An island of stars sitting two and a half million light years away from us. In one instant, with one measurement, almost a hundred years after Friedrich Bessel exploded our view of the edge of the universe, Hubble did it again. Our universe wasn't thousands or hundreds of thousands of light years wide, it was millions of light years wide. We had only just begun exploring the edge of the universe. That was 1922. In the decades that followed, astronomers did what astronomers do best, which is copy each other, good job. And they performed galaxy surveys, not star surveys, galaxy surveys, finding galaxy after galaxy after galaxy, measuring the distance to that galaxy, building a map of our universe. Here's one such survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at Apache Point in New Mexico in the United States. It's been mapping the universe for over 10 years. I'm going to show you a movie of the universe that is revealed by surveys like this, but I have to warn you, it's a little overwhelming. So we're going to start with something more familiar to get our sense of scale. When I first came to KAUST, I was impressed. This is a huge facility. It's impressive buildings. This is a large structure in the universe. We should be proud of ourselves for being capable of building such large things. But when we zoom out just a little bit, we can hardly see it. If we zoom out even further, then cities themselves become insignificant. If we zoom out even more, we can't tell one country apart from the other. But our world, our Earth is huge. It's so large that even though it's curved, it appears to be flat from any vantage point. That's how big it is. But compared to our sun, the Earth is nothing. Our sun, compared to a typical nebula, is almost meaningless. A typical nebula, compared to our galaxy, is invisible. Our own Milky Way galaxy stretches for 100,000 light years across and is home to over 300 billion stars, just like our own. But this isn't the edge. This movie is actually several years out of date by now, but I've never seen any movie like it, so I just love to show it. You're going to see half a million galaxies plotted, taken with data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's going to start at the center with the Milky Way and Andromeda, and it's going to zoom out. This is not a visualization. This is not a simulation. This is not an artist's rendition. These are real galaxies in their real positions in the real universe. Each one of these galaxies is tens to hundreds of thousands of light years across. The distances between any two galaxies is millions of light years. This is the edge of the universe. This is the cosmos as revealed by modern cosmology. And as we zoom out to the very largest of scales, we see something amazing, a structure, a pattern. 
the largest pattern found in nature. We call it the cosmic web. Long, thin filaments of galaxies, dense nodes called clusters, broad walls, vast empty regions of nothingness called the voids. This is our universe. We are just one tiny part of it. The edge of this plot is not the edge of the universe, it's the edge of the survey. We've mapped less than 0.1% of the volume of our cosmos. But that's not the only edge. That's an edge in space. There's also an edge in time. You see, Edwin Hubble made two remarkable discoveries. In 1922, he discovered that galaxies exist and are very far from us. This is an image of distant galaxies taken with the James Webb Space Telescope last year. Two years later, in 1924, he made another revolutionary discovery, that the galaxies are moving away from us. And that the more distant a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. We live in an expanding universe. If you map galaxies and measure the average position between galaxies at one snapshot in time, and then wait a year, a million years, a billion years, and do it again, you'll see that the galaxies are farther away from each other. The distance between galaxies grows with time. Our universe expands with time. Our universe is changing and evolving with time. We can run the clock backwards. In the distant past, our universe was smaller, denser, hotter. We can run the clock all the way back until a point about 13.8 billion years ago, when our universe was a million times smaller than it is today, all the material, all the stars, all the galaxies, you and me, every atom, was compressed into such a small volume that the temperature was so high that had a temperature of a plasma around 10,000 Kelvin. The entire universe was in a plasma state. And as it expanded from that state, the plasma cooled, and neutralized, the ions returned to their nuclei and released radiation. Initially, that radiation was white hot, temperature of 10,000 Kelvin, but that was 13.8 billion years ago. Since then, the universe has expanded and cooled. And now, that radiation has a temperature of three Kelvin. That's microwave radiation. When we look out on the sky, with microwave eyes past the stars, past the galaxies, we see this, the cosmic microwave background, an image of the universe as it was when it was only 380,000 years old. That's equivalent to a picture of you when you were seven seconds old. It's a baby picture of the universe. It's adorable. These tiny bumps and wiggles are variations in temperature across the universe, no bigger than one part in a million. They will someday grow up to become the galaxies and the clusters and the voids. You are seeing here the seeds of the largest structures in the universe. We understand the physics of the cosmic microwave background because we understand plasma physics. We can push the clock back even further to when the universe was even smaller. We understand, through our knowledge of physics, the state of the universe all the way down to the size of a peach and a temperature of a quadrillion degrees. We can chart the course of our universe through all that time. We call it the Big Bang model. Earlier than that, though, in the first fraction of a second of the existence of our universe, we have no idea. The temperatures are too extreme. The densities are too much. 
our understanding of physics breaks down. We have no theory of high energy physics that can grapple with the state of the universe in its earliest moments. This is not an edge in space, it's an edge in time. We do not understand the origins of the universe. We don't even know if the word origin makes sense if our conceptions of time and space even continue to such extreme scales. And there are more edges. There's an edge of knowledge. As we've continually pushed the boundaries of observations and gone deeper and deeper into the universe, we have revealed even more mysteries. Like if you look at a typical galaxy, you see all the light emitting objects, the stars, the nebula. You can use that to weigh the galaxy. You just add up all the light. But there are other ways to weigh a galaxy. To estimate the mass of a galaxy, you can use Kepler's laws. If you take a random star you know, in some random orbit and measure its velocity, then you know from Kepler's law that the speed of its orbit is determined by the amount of mass within that orbit. And it's not just Kepler's laws, it's Newton's laws and general relativity. They all agree here. And since the center of a galaxy, a core, contains about half the mass of a galaxy, you expect that as you go out to further and further distances, that these stars will slow down in their orbits because they're further away from all the mass. That's the exact opposite of what we see. Stars at the edge of a galaxy go just as fast as stars in the center. This was discovered in the 1970s by astronomer Vera Rubin. In the decades since, we've come to give it a name. We call it dark matter. Some invisible component to every galaxy. And for every kilogram of normal matter in a galaxy like you and me, there's approximately five kilograms of dark matter that does not interact with light or us. In fact, dark matter is probably streaming through this room right now. We simply can't detect it. We can only see it at large scales through its influence of gravity. We do not understand the nature of dark matter. There's an edge here, a mystery. There's another mystery. Occasionally, when we look out at the distant universe and map out distant galaxies, we see a supernova, the death of a massive star. A single supernova can outshine an entire galaxy for a few weeks. One explosion outshining hundreds of billions of stars. We can see them from literally across the universe. And some supernova are standard candles. Some supernova, some kinds. We know exactly how bright they should be, as if you were standing right next to it, which I advise against. But we know how bright they should be. We compare them to how bright they appear to us. We can calculate a distance. We can calculate distances out hundreds of millions of light years with this technique. And astronomers who first unlocked this in the 1990s came to a remarkable discovery. The expansion of our universe is accelerating. Our universe isn't just getting bigger and bigger every day, it's getting bigger and bigger faster and faster every day. The expansion of the universe, the evolution of our cosmos doesn't look like this, it looks like this. We have no idea why. We call it dark energy. It's a cool name. That's about all we have. We do not understand the source of this accelerated expansion in our universe. We don't. We can 
measure the amount of energy required to drive this anti-gravity accelerated expansion of the universe. And when we put it all together, when we put together dark energy, dark matter, normal matter, complete a census of the cosmos within the known edge, we find that normal matter, the matter of you and me and every star in the sky, composes less than 5% of the contents of the universe. Let that sink in. 95% of the universe is unknown. If that's not an edge, I don't know what is. 95% of the universe is unknown. This is where we are in modern cosmology. As we push the boundaries of the edge of the universe, as we push farther and farther and farther, we answer many questions. We've learned so much. But with, with every question we answer, we raise a dozen more. We push to the edge in space, we push to the edge in time, we push to the edge in knowledge and understanding. This is the joy of science. Each one of us is just a link in a chain, inheriting questions from the previous generation, making progress and giving new questions, passing them on. The universe is full of questions. The universe is full of edges waiting to be explored. And this is the great game of science. We are explorers. We seek the boundary. We seek the edge of what is known and we push past it. What will we get when we get there? What answers will we find? What questions will we find when we push past the known edge? Well, that's up to you. Thank you so much. Absolutely awesome talk, Paul. Thank you so much for expanding us. And now we can grill the professor if anyone wants to go to one of the microphones. Maybe I'll get started while we, while we land there. Um, why should we care about the rate of expansion of the universe? What ranges of expansion would yield qualitatively different end games? Uh, and how, how certain are we of the rate of expansion relative to those perhaps borders of different basins of behavior for the end of the universe. Absolutely, great set of questions. Why should we care about the present day expansion of the universe? Uh, the present day expansion of the universe is a little bit uncertain. Uh, we know it to within a few percent, uh, but we have two different sets of measurements that are giving two different sets of results. One set of measurements it's telling us the present day rate of expansion is 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. A megaparsec is a dis unit of distance, and it just means for every unit of that distance, the universe expands away from us faster and faster by 68 meters per second, kilometers per second. Another set of measurements gives us 72. And, you know, 20 years ago, we would have called that complete agreement. But now we have such precision measurements that these disagree. What this is telling us is that we are not understanding something about the universe. We know that our cosmological models are incomplete. And this is a sign from nature that it is incomplete, that there is still yet more to learn. Maybe the answer is in the nature of dark matter or dark energy. Maybe it's completely something else that we haven't thought of. This is an edge in modern cosmology, trying to understand and measure precisely this one number to reveal, well, whatever's next. Thank you. And now let's turn it over to some of the scholars. So we'll start yeah, here. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you highlighted some places where our knowledge is incomplete. But you also highlighted that in every previous era of astronomical understanding, things were not only incomplete, but there were wrong assumptions, right, that maybe look foolish to us now. Do you think 
that we've recognized all of our wrong assumptions and we only have incompleteness now? Or will future generations of mankind look back and say, ah, they were so foolish to believe that? I sincerely hope that future generations think that I'm foolish. Because uh, that means they've progressed. If they're still playing around with the exact same models that I am, then, then we're doing something wrong. Uh, and actually don't look back at uh, medieval astronomers as foolish. They were dealing with data, the best data they had, and they were coming up with the best models they had. They were very smart, industrious, capable people. We know our understanding of cosmology is incomplete. We don't understand dark matter. We don't understand dark energy. General relativity is incomplete. Quantum mechanics is incomplete. All the tools we use to understand the universe, we know are incomplete. Plus, as you mentioned, there are more things that we haven't even thought of yet. What direction it will go? I hope in my lifetime we come to some understanding of dark matter and dark energy. I'm guessing that even if we were to understand dark matter and dark energy and other mysteries, that, that would simply raise even more questions because now we have a new edge to, to explore. Thank you. Let's um, take the first question from yeah. stage left. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, really fascinating talk. And I'm not an astronomer by any means. And uh, neither my, am I. It's fine. And most of my understanding of stars probably comes from Star Trek, so it's not <laughs> a good reference. But most of the astronomy is usually observatory. Uh, so if you're looking at a star that's, say, 10, 20 light years away, mm -hmm. they usually say you're looking at what it looked like at some point back in time. So is there any proper scientific means to know whether the star is actually there or not? That is an excellent question. So when you look at 61 Cygni, that's 10 light years away, we're not seeing it as it is in this instant because the light took 10 years to get here. And so you're only seeing it as it was 10, 10 years ago. When we look at the Andromeda galaxy, which is the farthest object you can see with the naked eye, you're not seeing the Andromeda galaxy as it is today. You're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. And to your question, is there any way to know what's happening right now? The answer is no. The sun could blink out of existence, and it would take eight minutes for us to find out. Because the sun is eight light minutes away. We have no idea. Sleep well tonight. <laughs> Please, over here. Uh, so it's an amazing talk, and actually I'm speechless, but um, I mean, um, about expanding of the universe. Uh, actually, more than 1,400 years ago in Quran, our, created, our creator gave us a hint about this, and it's uh, in Quran, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّ لَمُوسِعُونَ Which means, uh, the heaven we constructed with, with strength, and indeed we're expanding. So it's so amazing how much scientific evidence in Quran about this universe and, um, yeah. Please yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. It's, when I say that scientists are part of a long chain, that chain doesn't stop in 1577 with Western European scientific revolution. Scientists themselves are philosophers. Like, I have a PhD that stands for philosophy doctor. Scientists are literally philosophers. We are a branch of philosophy. And philosophy itself is intertwined with theology, with music, with the arts, with, with everything, with the, the, the continuation of human exploration and understanding. When we search back into a medieval text, an ancient text, we find truths there that aren't just, don't just apply to our personal lives, but help us un inform and understand the universe itself. And that's a great example. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much, Professor, for such a mind-blowing uh, presentation. <laughs> I have a question, like, um, we talked about the expansion of the universe, mm -hmm. so do we have any information on uh, what exactly the universe is expanding into? Great question, I love this question. So in order to answer the question, we're going to do a little exercise. What we're going to do is we're all going to take a deep breath, then I'll give the answer, and then we're going to take immediately, without thinking about it, another deep breath. 
right? So everyone, we're going to breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth. So the universe has no center and it has no edge. <laughs> you need to do it. You need to calm yourself when you, you encounter this. The universe has no edge. I know the title of my talk is The Edge of the Universe. That's the, the joke. Um, the universe is expanding. When we say that the universe is expanding, we say that the average distance between galaxies grows with time. There is no center. There is no edge. The Big Bang didn't happen over there or over there. The Big Bang happened right here and in the Andromeda galaxy and throughout the entire universe. The Big Bang is not a point in space. It's a point in time. Our entire universe has no edge, and I know that's hard to think about. Uh, an expanding universe that is not even expanding into nothing, it's just you can't even define it. There is no such thing as an outside to the universe. Because if there were an outside, the definition of the universe is all the stuff. So if there's an outside, that's a side that has to be included in the definition. The universe has no edge. I know it's hard to think about. And it's okay. I can't visualize it myself. But that's why we have mathematics. That's why we have scientific models. They're tools that allow us to grapple with concepts that we normally couldn't handle. So clearly we don't have an edge, right? There is no, there's no edge. Sorry, my whole talk is a lie. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll get a better speaker next year. Okay, yeah, better speaker next year. <laughs> okay, please. Thank you so much, Paul, for your great talk. It was, it was the most interesting lecture or session <laughs> we had. Well, my question is, we know that the, uh, the, the, universe, the universe is expanding, and we know that we are expecting a collision with Andromeda Galaxy after billion, several billions of years. So the question is, how it could be to have two objects uh, that are moving towards each other in opposite direction while they're supposed to move in the direction of the expansion? That's a great question. Can we actually go back to my presentation? Can we pull up a slide? Oh, can I control it? I'd... Uh, so, so while we're pulling it up, I, I'd like to show you the cosmic web again. And I, and I had to be very, very careful with my wording where I said the universe is expanding, galaxies are getting farther away from each other on average. It's at the very largest scales. Uh, back. Oh, now I can control it? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. When we go back to the cosmic web here, <laughs> you have to think cosmologically to talk about these kinds of questions because this is an entire galaxy. This is an entire galaxy. The distance between these two galaxies is insignificant. Yeah, it's millions of light years, but our observable universe is 92 billion light years across. So yes, there can be small scale interactions where two galaxies are close enough together that their mutual gravity allows them to combine. And yes, in cosmology, millions of light years is considered small scale. It's only at larger scales do we see the expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yes. Yeah. alaikum, sir. You say the, there is a change, there, uh, the gal galaxies, there is changing uh, distance between them. Mm -hmm. So uh, is, is there a, a possibility of an accident between them? Yes, absolutely. In fact, the previous uh, questioner just asked that. We, our Milky Way galaxy, is going to merge with Andromeda. We are going to crash into an Andromeda in about five billion years. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, you, you can set have fun, your watch. kids. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one or two more. So let's go to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this speech. And my question will be about historical issues. Mm -hmm how people in the uh, medieval time or the modern age uh, know the distance from Saturn to Earth. In fact, they thought uh, Earth is in the center of the universe. And also how in the 19th century people recognize light year as a measure of distance. 
I think that time people believe that light is going uh, instantly from point to point. Great pair of questions. So for the first one, if we thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe, how could we measure the distance to Saturn? Uh, so we were actually able to calculate relatively accurately the distances to uh, the sun, uh, the moon, and all, and all the planets uh, because the planets themselves move. And even in old cosmological models, like the platonic model that put the Earth at the center, if you know that the planets are moving, you can calculate how quickly they are moving, and then uh, you can calculate a distance from that planet to the Earth, just based on how quickly they're moving and how quickly they, they move across the sky. So it's all based on very precise measurements. As to the second question with the light year, beginning in the 1800s, we were beginning to understand that light traveled at a finite speed, and we had a relatively accurate measurement of the speed of light uh, from that. It was a little bit off from today, and so Friedrich Bessel's original measurement was a, about 10% off from the modern estimate of the distance to 61 Cygni, and that was because of the inaccuracy of the measurement of the speed of light. But we were starting that in the 1800s. I'm being told by our gracious hosts to wind up the large group questions. Paul has told me in advance that he's more than willing to stick around and take a lot of your questions. Also, we can mention that he's going to be taking part in a book signing in the lobby uh, for his book, How to Die in Space. So maybe that's something you want to read tonight. But uh, before we let you go and go to a smaller group, I, I want to do two things. First, thank you again in unison, Paul. You've taken us to the edge. And uh, we also want to present you with a, a, a retro gift, uh, an Arabian astrolabe. Uh, the astrolabe, we don't know when it was invented, but we know already in about the 400s, the Egyptian mathematician Hypatia wrote about the astrolabe. Some people have said there's more than a 1,000 kinds of uh, measurements that can be done with this. One of the most basic is to use it as a sextant to find out your latitude. And there's a little booklet in here that may fill you in in some of the ancient oh, uses great. of this Arabian instrument. Now I don't need a supercomputer. That's right. You don't I got need a this. GPS. I'm all set. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. What, what, a, what a wonderful um, end of the formal lectures today. And I hope uh, that this carries over into your dinner conversations and maybe to some conversations at the book table. Uh, Daria will have the final word. <laughs> no, um, thank you for coming because there are other workshops following up. We just have to end now. But as mentioned, Paul will be outside book signing and answer your questions. So please don't, don't go. I feel, I feel sorry. Okay, we can continue the discussion outside. Thank you. Thank you.